Paul Rust, uh, you created love with uh, Judd Apatow, uh, your wife, Leslie Arfin. Uh, how did the idea for the show come about? How did love come to be? Uh, yeah, and, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. It's nice to be here. Uh, <laughs> uh, the idea originally started off as a, a Leslie and I um, had an idea for a movie based on a, a couple that was similar to Gus and Mickey, and it was actually a little further along in their relationship. It's not that you ever saw them meet. It was just a, a story about this couple. And we presented it to Judd as a, an outline for a movie uh, because Judd and I uh, had previously worked together and Leslie and Judd had previously worked together on Girls. And so uh, and Judd and I were working on this Pee Wee Herman movie together. And we presented him this outline uh, for a movie and he really liked it. He liked the characters a lot. But I think he felt that if we did it as a film, we would have to rush through a lot of interesting stuff about this couple. And he had a, a longstanding idea to do a TV show that was about one relationship from the moment the people meet until it was ever decided when it would end. And I think he saw these characters had this idea for a show in mind and merged the two together. And, uh, uh, and that's what, how uh, love began. <clears throat> That's good. So let's talk about uh, some of these characters. Um, Gus is your character. He's sort of set up um, in the series as a nice guy, the nice guy, Gus. But mm. then later on in the series, it become, it gets questioned as to whether he is actually a nice guy or is a guy pretending to be a nice guy. Is Gus a nice guy? Uh, I'd say Gus is a nice guy. I mean, I think that the show is trying to kind of uh... – I don't know, pose some sort of question of like, what is niceness? Is niceness like genuine? Does it no longer become nice if you're, um, if you have an agenda? As soon as niceness has an agenda, does that mean it's not nice anymore? <laughs> I think it's kind of like uh, interesting territory that we like to, you know, and I, I think that speaks to maybe this idea that uh, the sort of doing it as a film versus a TV show in a film, it could only kind of be a very simple, yes, he is a nice guy. And uh, it, with a TV show, you know, with a, the first season, knowing that we had sort of five and a half hours to explore characters, we we're able to go deeper and sort of like look at, is this person truly nice, you know? Uh, and it's interesting because, you know, when I first saw Knocked Up, there's a scene that's kind of specifically about that. There's a scene where... Leslie Mann says to Paul Rudd's character, Leslie Mann's character says to Paul Rudd's character, um, just because you don't yell doesn't mean you're not nice. And I remember when sitting in the theater in Burbank watching that, I was like, the, the roof of the theater had opened up and a light came down. I was just like, oh, this is my issue. This, and it felt so good to see it represented in a movie. So I'd like to think that like nearly a decade later, this one thing that was just an element to knocked up sort of became a whole character on this TV show that we could explore. But yeah, whether he's nice or not, I don't know. I guess that's for others to decide and uh, debate about. <laughs> and, and on the flip side, you've got uh, Mickey and sort of the question is, is she a, like sort of a bad girl? Is she uh, sort of the, the, the rebel or whatever? And it's sort of like that comes to a head a bit in the scene uh, on the studio tour. Yeah, where, you get, like, where she gets kicked out of the studio is to sort of um, all these questions about is she really the bad girl? Are you really the nice guy? All that sort of stuff. Uh, what do you think her character brings uh, to the sort of the, the love story and the the partnership between the two? Yeah, well, you know, uh, we really went after Gillian Jacobs for the part of Mickey. Um, she was our who we were writing in mind with, and then it ended up being this really fortunate situation where uh, we were just about to start working on the show as community was wrapping up and it was a, a rare time to be able to uh, um, be able to cast Gillian and we knew that because community was wrapping up there was going to be a, a land rush on Gillian Jacobs people would want to work with her because she's so amazingly talented and and bright you know and the reason we wanted to have her uh, played Mickey was because I just noticed in her 
sort of previous work. Um, she does play somebody who's maybe has like a rough exterior or is challenging. And the thing that I always really recognized in Gillian and appreciated was that she didn't sort of stand in judgment of complicated characters. If anything, she sort of accepted it as a challenge of how am I going to make this person relatable, even though there might be stuff that people don't want to relate to. Um, and, uh, you know, she came through for us, like, uh, I would say 100 percent but i would say it's even more than that 110 percent if you can believe it she just like uh uh really just developed this character who in the same way that like as gus you start realizing maybe this guy isn't the nice guy that he presents him to be himself to be similarly uh mickey is a uh, a woman who presents herself as tough but maybe there's something underneath there that's actually more vulnerable and sensitive and that became the fun of both writing and acting and producing the first season was getting to kind of follow that um, that shift sort of in the midpoint of the season where you start going deeper with the characters. Yeah, and like, I guess because like it's a series and not a, a, a feature film is that you do have the ebbs and flows of the characters. It's like, you know, a couple of episodes where you're really frustrated one of the characters and then it flips on its head a couple of episodes later and it's sort of also interesting for a story about two people sort of uh meeting each other and developing a relationship there's some episodes where you uh, and mickey uh spend so little time together like it's sort of like two completely separate shows um what is sort of like balancing all those different sort of pacing uh like uh, as a writer but also as an actor yeah um yeah, I think the pace um, ended up kind of becoming one of the um, distinguishing features of the show as we were writing it and working on it. Um, you know, when we first sat down in the writer's room and we're kicking around ideas, uh, we initially it was moving very fast. You know, I think by the second or third episode, they were dating. They were like frequently dating and going out on dates. And Judd, uh, very wisely, um, was following this instinct of, you know, we, we knew that the, the couple wasn't going to meet until the end of the pilot. Um, that was like an interesting thing for us to pull off, this idea that you would be following two characters separately and not have them meet until the very, very end of the pilot. And I think Judd sort of ran with that and was like, well, if that is true, if these two people don't meet up until the end of the pilot, maybe the whole first season can kind of follow that pace, which is like um, having episodes where we go back to this format where they're in two separate worlds and we follow them separately. and They're not necessarily interacting within the episode and going as slow as possible. And, you know, honestly, I'm sure that's born out of the fact that we knew we had two seasons and uh, 22 episodes ahead of us that we could move at a at a pace that was more patient. And maybe if it had been a week to week show that people were watching regularly week to week, uh, it'd be harder to have people be patient and be like, OK, I know you've been watching this for a month now and they haven't gone on a first date yet. But don't worry, it's coming. You know, it, it was a lot easier to do it in a setup where we knew people would have the ten episodes right in front of them. Mm. Yeah, and um, what what do you think the like the most important element is of the love story you're trying to tell here? Um, no, I mean, I think first and foremost, we're uh, trying to have it be as. Um, I don't want to say real as possible because I think if something just tries to be real, it's a little boring. You're kind of like, why am I watching this thing? That's just, <laughs> so it, 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 I'd say it was more trying to be like truthful. And if, if something happened, we could either say, well, this happened to me before, or I know that this has happened to a friend before. And as best we could trying to make it feel like, it was something authentic to people's experiences that said, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that when I watch it, I'm like, well, that would never happen. That couldn't have happened. And blah, blah. There's a whole list of stuff, but I'd say all in all the, the, you know, the primary goal was to make stuff feel 
true. Um, but then I guess kind of connected with that, the whatever we were trying to do in representing a relationship, I guess for me personally, you know, I get a little like um, exhausted by in TV and movies, there's always this sort of like, people seem to like to watch characters who are uh, cooler than they are or smarter than they are or more sophisticated than they are. And I get a little exhausted by that because I'm kind of like, eh, I hate seeing, just in my daily life, I hate seeing people front. And then to watch a TV show or a movie where the actors are playing characters who are fronting, it's just like, it gets, it's not as uh, compelling for me. And so I think the thing that we, myself, my wife, Leslie, Judd, Gillian, all of us who were working on the show, the thing we most wanted was this uh, thing of like, hey, if you're not totally cool, that's okay. Or if you have vulnerability, like, I don't know. It seems like a rare thing to be vulnerable these days. So I think that more than anything was like trying to create a show that was like a safe space for vulnerability, if anything, because uh, there could be more of that, I think, in TV and movies, the sort of seeing people be vulnerable. And that, that for me, was the most interesting thing about being able to do a show about a relationship. Mm. And speaking about that vulnerability and that, uh, you know, sort of people in this show don't have it completely together. And there is that sort of like loneliness and sort of some disappointed dreams and uh, people probably not exactly where they thought they'd be and things like that. Is LA the perfect setting for this show? Could you have said it anywhere else? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny. I'm originally from Iowa and when I would watch movies or TV shows growing up and they were all based in Los Angeles, I was always like, why? Why do they base them in Los Angeles? There's other states and other, I believe there's 49 other states of this country. Why aren't they making movies and TV shows there? And then, you know, I moved to LA like 10 years ago and within two weeks of moving here, I was like, why would anybody shoot anywhere else? <laughs> like I quickly <laughs> like <laughs> at a 180. <laughs> uh, so that certainly is like a question on my mind when we're making it is like, well, if we are basing in Los Angeles, why? And let's make the most of it. I think, you know, the thing I like about the show is I feel like the, this relationship and these characters could exist anywhere else. You know, there's, there's guys like Gus and women like, Mickey and guys like Mickey and women like Gus all over the world, you know, but if we are making the choice that they're in LA, I think the thing that maybe makes it most sort of LA-ish is the, you know, it's a city where it's sort of sprawling with different neighborhoods and it's sometimes just the logistics of I'm going to go to this person's house becomes an ordeal where it's like a two hour drive just to try to connect with somebody. So maybe there's something there of kind of like, oh, Mickey and Gus, they live in a city where it's designed to be impossible to connect. And that's certainly like borne out in the season where they're sometimes, yeah, have entire episodes where they're not interacting. I think also maybe the thing that like, I like that it takes place in LA is that they are talking about it as a city where things are filmed and that it is a town where you could be driving down the street and be seeing a camera set up or walk in accidentally walk into a filming location and be like, Oh, I'm they're shooting a CSI here. And I didn't even know that at least for me felt like the wrinkle we were bringing into it is that it is LA is a city where you can drive by the house, that's from a movie that you saw two nights ago. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's like, yeah, like it's an easy uh, city to get lost in, but also a city where there's a lot of fun things to find. Yeah. And you know, like the thing that's cool and I feel like we see this in Mickey's friends and Gus's friends, a bunch of different people traveled here, you know, um, I don't know. There's certainly like the stereotype of the, uh, the aunt that entourage created of like or or perpetuated of like the LA type and the thing that shocked me when I first moved to LA is like oh I'm mostly meeting people who moved here just like me and they are kind-hearted people from all over the country 
and it's very easy and exciting to meet people who grew up loving the same stuff you did, but you never met them and you couldn't meet them until everybody moved to LA. So uh, it's certainly, I hope that the, when people watch it, it doesn't feel like we're, we're ragging on LA. Cause I actually, I really love the city and, and uh, uh, sort of the people that it brings together. Is, it's nice. Hmm. Do you have a most, there's some awkward scenes in love. What was the most awkward for you as an actor? It's interesting. Yeah. The, uh, the reaction to the show anecdotally or just what I see on, uh, on the internet and when people talk about it is like how awkward something was or how it made them cringe. And it really shocked me because that word never came up when we were writing it or making it. We never thought of something as like, oh, this is gonna be a very awkward scenario or this situation is gonna be make people cringe. We never talked about it in those terms. And then so when the reaction was so much about that, it caught me off guard because I was like, oh, that wasn't, in a weird way, I think what we were just trying to do was like create something that we felt was true and, uh, realizing later like oh i guess that just means uh, uh real situations usually are awkward <laughs> like <laughs> by virtue of us just trying to do something real with you know admittedly i guess some conflict because you got to have something going on in the episode and if it's real then and i think because there's not a lot of uh there's not a lot of um villains on the show a lot of times the villain is like the person themselves that are getting in the way of themselves there's no bad guys that that kind of automatically means oh then it's going to be awkward or there's going to be cringy stuff because that is the conflict that comes out of when you don't have like clear joker-esque villains <laughs> you know in the show so um so that's my long way of saying when we were making it there was nothing awkward i think you know for me there's a, a moment in episode five when I go on a date with Mickey's roommate Birdie and uh, I start trying to micromanage uh, whether she's cold or warm and she's like underneath a vent and there's an air conditioning you know pumping cold air down on her and I become fixated on are you comfortable should we move to another table and I know from my own experience I've ruin dates and social interactions with the awkwardness of standing back and making the judgment for the other person that they are cold and they need help right now. And the person's like, yeah, stand back. I'm doing fine. <laughs> like it's more annoying that you care and are trying to control this. So, uh, that's certainly when we were shooting, I was like, Oh, I've been here. I've done this awkward thing. Yeah. Um, if if you got uh, nominated for lead actor um, at the Emmy Awards uh, this year, uh, what episode would you submit to the judges? Ah, oh, that's a good question. I guess um, you know I'm really fond of um, the the second episode when we finally get Gillian uh, as Mickey and myself as Gus together, and we're walking around the neighborhood and, and talking. There's just something really, I mean, because Gillian's so good, it's just so much fun doing scenes with her. And I think there's just like, you know, from the beginning of entertainment, there is just something very pleasurable about watching two people meet each other for the first time and get to know one another. And it can be very simple. You don't need much conflict you don't need much like antagonism between the characters there's just something enticing about two people becoming familiar with each other that for me was really fun to act and uh, fun for me to have people watch and enjoy so i like that and then yeah i guess uh in episode five when i go on this bad date with with birdie I, i'm also i guess that's the opposite end of the uh, spectrum of what i'm talking about like in episode two it's meeting somebody and having a good and kind of being relaxed and comfortable with the person. And then in episode five, it's the opposite when, uh, when, uh, two people and the idea of that, I guess was, Oh, Gus and Birdie are two people who view themselves as nice people. 
And a lot of times two nice people just can't get a chemistry going because they need somebody else who's a little darker to kind of have the friction of like, I'm trying to boost you up and I'm trying to darken you. And, you know, and when it's just two bright, lighthearted people getting together, it's like, oh, there can only be one. There can only be one good person here. <laughs> so somebody eventually has to become the bad person. And that was fun for me getting to play like near the end of that day when I realized like, oh, she's going to be the nice person in this day. I guess I'll be the asshole. And that was fun. It's fun playing an asshole. Mm, yeah. And that's a good um, it's a good episode because at the end you have the scene where you uh, get mad at Mickey a bit and then she comes out and kisses you. So, like, there's a, some good scenes for you in that yeah. particular episode. Yeah. Oh, thanks. How much as a performer has your uh, – as an actor in this show, how much has it helped uh, the long form improv you've done with the UCB and your um, sort of performing there? Yeah, well, you know, I yeah, I started uh, acting at the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater, uh, the UCB, in two thousand five. So by the time we started shooting the show, I'd been doing long form improv there for about a decade, and you know. Um, your question is sort of like, how did it being on the show affect my improv? But to take it a step back, the my improv training really helped on the show, which is, you know, the main thing that they kind of push at the UCB is, when you're doing improv is for characters to be at the top of their intelligence. And like, it's very easy to get an easy laugh by playing dumb. And not just dumb in terms of like, I don't know the state of California, you know, I don't know the capital of California dumb, but also like dumb of like somebody who's not aware of their own emotions or the effect they're having on the emotions of another person. And when you're in an improv scene, there's this high priority on just uh, listening to the person and responding in a way that's, again, truthful. And when you try to overreach for a joke or create a scenario, that's when things start to feel sweaty. And you can, after 10 years of performing in front of an audience, it's very clear you get an instant reaction of when you've made a choice where people are like, eh, that person wouldn't do that. Or I'm not, a, I know that this person's just reaching for the joke or the laugh. And so that's my long way of saying when we were shooting this first season, that was like, certainly something that I took with me, which was like, oh, always try to keep this in a way that if somebody was watching it, uh, you know what it is? It's like giving the audience credit that they're going to be able to understand this thing that you're going for that might not be the easiest thing to get across. And like respecting the audience as intelligent human beings who can get something. And so that was definitely... Uh, um, uh, I, I think in the forefront of my mind when we were acting the scenes was like making sure that considering the audience, you know, treating them as if they were geniuses, you know, and I think that's paid off in the response to the show. I can tell people feel like touched by like, oh, this person's giving me the credit that I'm going to understand emotionally what these people are going through and make me feel less alone about the feelings that I have. Um, and then as, in terms of how it's affected it afterwards, you know, I just did a show last night that was an improv show at the UCB, and we've been shooting the second season for about uh, five weeks now. And I realized that uh, when I'm on stage, I started doing stuff smaller because I've been in front of a camera where you don't have to be as big and stuff will get across. And I actually had to make an adjustment like five minutes in where I was like, oh, I'm playing this like way too small. And so <laughs> there's also an adjustment of like, I just have to raise my voice up a little bit. So <laughs> that's the effect it's had is like I've gotten quieter on stage. <laughs> yeah. When I was in LA in January, I got to um, last day of school and you were, oh, you were in it. Oh, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, it was that's good. Fun show. Yeah. For memory, uh, there was a sketch on um, the uh, a, a wizard that was um, <laughs> that was that was a uh, prejudice, a prejudicial wizard. Oh, a prejudicial uh, wizard. Yes. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's funny because uh, uh, with so many scenes, you, you know, you do like six or seven scenes every 
Thursday night every week at 11. And when I think back about how many scenes that I've been a part of that just like, especially now with the internet, you know, like people make a video and it's on there forever. And with stuff that felt very special in the night, it, it's, a, it's a little more ephemeral. Like, oh, it's nice that you remember that, that scene, but uh, it happened and it began and then there and there's no record of it. But uh, uh, there's actually something sort of um, nice or comforting about that at the same time too, of just like, oh, I'll go, I'll have fun. And it doesn't, I don't have to be racked with the idea that it's on uh, the internet forever. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and there's something special about that too. That there's just, it's like a scene that's just shared between those performances performers and the audiences in the room that's just their show like you know and uh, yeah. no one's no one ever no one else outside of that room will ever know that yeah. yeah i know i i you're putting it very well i love that that's like my favorite thing about it is getting to have like it's the same reason why people want to go to the movies or something is like oh i'm sitting in a theater and i'm having a collective experience with like 70 other people it's just it's a rare thing, so uh, yeah, that's that's the nice thing for me about it, for sure. And it's particularly, I think, um, sort of cool or maybe like helpful or saying I don't know that um, so many actors from the UCB are getting on TV, but then like UCB wasn't sort of a stepping stone to get there. They're still going and doing the shows as often as they can. Um, you know, people like Ben Schwartz and Matt Walsh and all those guys. It's yeah. not like, oh, I just want to do the improv to get on TV, but it's something they see as important to keep doing, as, as you do. Yeah, you know, it, it mainly comes out of, I never saw it, truly never saw it as a, a stepping stone to something uh, bigger or more fame-drenched. <laughs> it was never about that. It was about like, oh, this is such a fun theater to be able to learn stuff about yourself and learn about like get better at whatever you're trying to get better at. And, uh, if there was any sort of stepping stone, it was the stepping stone of, I want to meet more people and make more friends. Uh, so yeah. the, and that's why I, I keep performing there is like all my friends perform there. It's a great way to see my friends. Uh, so there's something nice about it. It, it feels less, uh, craven and gross to not be like oh i'm doing it for career reasons uh, genuinely i think most people do it because they like the community of people that they get to meet and become friends with mm. Which is um, nice. yeah oh yeah and uh, with love with the uh gus and mickey romance uh you and your wife created the series um mm -hmm. how much of it is based on you guys and your like relationship and how you guys got together at all <laughs> no, not at all <laughs> No, you know, it, uh, it certainly, you know, there were things that we used as jumping off points, but it, it's more, I'd say, based on either our, our past experiences in other relationships or more so the observations we've made about our friends and the people we've met through our lives and their relationships. I think it's kind of twofold. One, I think if we did base it on our lives a lot, it'd honestly be a little boring because each of us are, we've been in therapy, we're a little more <laughs> self-aware, like it, it wouldn't be as fun watching two characters get together who are aware of their hangups. There's something fun about Gus and Mickey that they're a little more blind about what their mistakes are in life and it just allows for more conflict and I don't think we'd have that if we based it on our lives. But it's also like, if I was an outsider looking in on the show and I heard that two of the three co-creators were basing a show about their relationship, I'd be like, ugh, pass. I'm not going to watch this. This is so gross. Why do they think that their relationship is so interesting that it should be on TV? So, let, and Leslie and I had that immediate reaction after we sold the show. We were just like, oh, we hope people don't think this is, like, gross, that it's like, oh, they're based, they think they're so special. They're doing a show about themselves. So... For that reason alone, we were just like, ah, oh, let's try to do something different and, and make it about not us and more about people who are like this, you know. 
So it's more rather than let's write a story about us going, okay, let's get all our notes from all the relationships of the past and all our friends' relationships and come up and put it all together. Like, yeah, yeah. And people got to be careful what they say around us now because yeah. a lot of times it'll end up popping up. That's <laughs> like a yeah. bit of dialogue or something, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, if you were to like, um, what, what, like if you were to summarize um, love in like a tagline or a sentence or something like that to just describe what this love story was, what would you, um, how would you describe it? Oh, um, probably can't give it in the same, uh, I'm not a, a good marketing person, so I wouldn't have a <laughs> slogan, but I would say maybe what the show is sort of about is like in the same way that when you start dating somebody, you slowly start kind of like, stripping away what you imagine them to be and slowly get to know the person for who they really are. I think that's probably what the show is, is trying to do is like in the pilot, you meet these two people and you have an, I, you go, Oh, I get who this person is and I'm attracted to them or I'm not attracted to them based on what my vision of them is. And then as the longer you date and the more you get to know somebody, you realize like, there's more complexity or nuances to this person that you had sort of in your mind gone, oh, I know who this type is. And, you know, it ends up being like a thing that I think like you could either take it as like, a, oh, this is the my personal experience of how I get to know somebody. They get deeper and deeper as I go. But it could also be just on a purely like uh, as, a, as an entry into romantic comedies just – being like, oh, in a romantic comedy, a lot of times you meet somebody, they're presented as one thing, and then they stay that one thing for the next two hours with some slight adjustments. And with this, I guess it was sort of like trying to look at maybe types that you've seen in a genre before and uh, just try to go further and further in terms of making them uh, complex, dimensional characters. Season one was pretty much like in my opinion an arc of bringing these two people together of mm -hmm. like you know um rather than about them being together what is season two like looking forward to season two like what is that gonna be yeah um well without uh spoiling anything mm -hmm. but I, yes. you know i think the, the idea is that yeah if the first season was about what these two people have to do to even start being in the realm of thinking, oh, I could be in a relationship with somebody else. Season two, it, it feels like it's sort of shaping up to be about two people who at least, they're not saying they're in a relationship at all, but it is saying, oh, I realize that I care enough about this person to at least explore the idea of could I be open to being in a relationship with this person. So in typical fashion, we're asking the questions very slowly <laughs> and not getting the answers for many, many episodes. But um, as Judd sort of correctly pointed out, a lot of times when you're watching a romantic comedy, the stuff that you like most is the getting together and how it takes a long time to get the people together. And that's sort of the most exciting stuff to watch. So I think we're actually kind of pumping the brakes a bit so that we don't immediately get into the stuff where people go like, eh, I'm watching people... Uh, argue about what they're uh about the person's dirty underwear it's like we got time to get to the dirty underwear stage <laughs> we can enjoy just like the the fun of seeing how two people try to connect uh we're stretching it out <laughs> we're trying to get the most of it <laughs> um, using every plus, part of the buffalo <laughs> what's what sorry paul oh i said you, we're trying to use every part of the buffalo uh, of a yeah. relationship yeah Oh, that's good. Uh, last question: Is there uh, was there any moment in the past season, um, in season one, that particularly resonated with you or struck a nerve with you um, as you were writing or performing it? Yeah, you mentioned earlier the argument they have on the studio lot outside the table read, and you know they're they're fighting with each other, they're having an argument, and you know Mickey goes, "Hey, I'm not just." the cool girl you can sleep with so you feel like you're a cool person and not a dork. And then Gus goes, oh, so that's how you see me. I'm just this dork who you can sleep with and, and feel better and feel like you're getting your life together. And the thing I liked about that was that's something that is clear 
to the audience from the moment those two people meet each other at the end of episode one, anybody, any audience member watching would go, oh, I see what's going on here. He's doing this so he can feel this way and she's going with him so she can feel this way. And I like that, you know, there's maybe some danger in having the characters speak the thing that is uh, like, oh, would we lose gas by having the characters be aware of that? But the thing that I liked about having the characters say that to each other is, oh, people in real life are aware of why they're doing things a lot of times and how what they want and how other people see them. And I guess I just liked being able to play a scene where characters have the sort of emotional intelligence to be able to talk in that way. And it's not just like the frustration of like being like, do these characters really not know? Like when you watch a lot of stuff, like do they really not know the impact they have on other people and how they come across? And uh, so that was, I think the, the fun for me uh, and the, the scene that I, I liked the most uh, in the first season with me and Mickey. Hmm. Uh, well, all the best of luck with season two of Love, Paul. Um, and also for the Emmys this year, for the lead actor race, for the comedy series race, for all the other categories like writing, directing and things like that. Um, thanks uh, thanks so much for chatting with us today. Oh, yeah. Thanks for chatting with me. It was a great time. I had a fun time. Yeah.